So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our first ever Future of Consultancy webinar. Um, we are setting these up because we've got quite a lot of research and quite a lot of um, really good learning coming out from our, our members around the future of consultancy. And these webinars are set up as a series um, to support the sharing of that learning. So you're all very welcome, whether you're an ABU member or whether you're a member of the wider industry and you're interested in the future of consultancy, uh, you're, you're welcome on both fronts. So um, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Hannah Vickers. I'm the Chief Executive of the Association for Consultancy and Engineering. Um, and as the representative um, body for the consultancy and engineering um, firms and the professions, we are doing this research to, to move our section of the industry forward. Um, and we'd started it pre-COVID, but I should, probably in terms of context would add that it's becoming even more important now because there's a huge opportunity coming out of uh, the current outbreak to be able to really use this as a catalyst for change in the industry. So you could say we were ahead of the game. Um, obviously nobody knew this was coming, so I can't really claim that. But, um, but as it stands, I think we've got an awful lot that we could pick up from this webinar series to really help businesses thinking about their recovery, thinking about how they reinvent themselves um, for, for what the markets and the, and the industry is going to be doing in future. So that's the context for it. This one is on evolving business models. We've got a few others which I'll um, outline when we come to, to the end of this um, hour that we've got today. So this is the first in the series. We've got some fantastic panellists um, who I will introduce uh, in a second. Um, but if I could just go through um, the format of the agenda for today. So we have an hour in total. Um, we're going to be uh, looking at some of our research on the business models uh, in consultancy. And I've got two fantastic uh, speakers to do this with me. Uh, I've got Emma Jane Houghton, who is an independent consultant, um, but has also um, been very experienced both in terms of working in infrastructure advisory in KPMG and also more recently in Heathrow Expansion Programme. So she's got a very long um, career looking at these sorts of challenges in the industry, both from a client side and having been in a consultancy business. So great to be able to, to pick Emma Jane's brains around this. Um, and in particular, because she is uh, one of the sort of the, the leading researchers, if you like, uh, on our, our piece of work around future of consultancy business models. So bringing all of her skills to bear to, to help us um, for the greater good of the industry at the moment. So welcome, Emma Jane. Um, Thank you, Emma. Hi, um, I'd also like to introduce um, Sarah Wilkes. So Sarah's day job is in Arcadis. Um, she's a, a management consultant who works within the business, but is actually, again, um, looking within Arcadis, has been doing an awful lot of research and almost business transformation internally within Arcadis around their business models and how they set themselves up to be fit for the future and to serve their clients better. So I think a, a great opportunity to hear from a practitioner, if you like, um, on what this looks like when you're trying to do it within your own business. So um, you're very welcome to, to join us this morning, Sarah. Thank you. Okay, and then, so we're going to start with a, um, a bit of a presentation from, from both of our speakers, and then we've got time at the end for Q&A. So just before we kick off with that, a little bit of housekeeping for you. Um, if you haven't joined us before on any webinars, we've done quite a few over the last few weeks, you don't know what you're missing. Um, but if you haven't joined us before, you best stop listening to your headphones because uh, you'll miss out on any background noise. Um, secondly, you'll also see on the right hand side of your screen, there's a panel that has questions in it, or a, a sort of um, ability to be able to ask questions through the chat function. So if you could send the, uh, the questions in, and you can do it at any point, you don't have to wait for the end. Um, so any questions you've got around consultancy business models, how they might change, things that will be prompted um, for you as we go through the presentations, please do send those in. Uh, and what we will do is to pick those up during the second half of the webinar and I'll do a bit of a Q&A with some of our speakers uh, and just try to draw out particular areas where perhaps you want a bit more information or you've got something that's relevant to your particular business. Um, if we don't get through all the questions today, we will uh, try to pick up with you after the webinar and send you a response via email. So don't let that put you off. Please do send them in. Um, and then lastly, just to say that we are going to be recording this and it will be available um, open source on our website. So um, you'll be able to watch back the presentations from today and also you'll be able to share it with colleagues. So again, if you find this useful, helpful, interesting and you want to use it as a reference point, we'll be able to we will be providing the link so that you can you can share it and uh, promote it within your organisations, because we hope 
you know, our intention is with this series of webinars is to create things of real value that help businesses through some of the difficult times that they're, they're facing at the moment. So I think that's probably enough from uh, myself in terms of introduction and overview. So I'd just like to, to now hand over to our, our um, presenters, our speakers. Uh, so I've introduced them already, um, Emma Jane Houghton and Sarah Wilkes, who are going to take us through a presentation um, just on evolving the business models and their experiences. So over to you. Many thanks, Hannah, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I do think it's where Sarah and I sort of discussed our joint presentation and we both wanted to um, outline a bit more about who we are, what we care about and our background. So I think um, that's still a, a, a really good starting point for us both. So I'll start with myself. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my background is as a chartered quantity surveyor. Um, and I've got a mixed career, really, in major project delivery and in consulting. I'd say that's roughly probably about 50-50. So in the first half of my career, I started at Terminal 5. I spent five very happy years down at Terminal 5, still my, my best project, really. Uh, and from there, I went to the East London Line project uh, and network rail, Crossrail. So I have a mix of sort of pre and post contract roles. And that's important because that really gave me the... Um, experience of having seen how a pre-contract strategy then manifests in delivery and the, the benefits and the problems that result um, and I've done that both client and contract aside. As, as Hannah outlined I spent some time with KPMG's infrastructure advisory group, I was there for five years uh, working with clients on a mix of setup and turnaround of major projects and programs um, and here developed a niche in collaborative procurement uh, latterly, I was the commercial director at Heathrow until recently, um, and now I'm focusing on a handful of uh, private advisory roles, one of which I'm delighted to say is with ACE. So for me, I'm, I'm passionate about construction, really keen to play my role in helping our industry deliver smarter and realise its potential. Uh, and I'm super excited to be involved in the Future of Consultancy programme, Sarah. Thanks, Emma Jane. Um, uh, thank, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Wilkes. I'm um, currently um, working in a, a global team at Arcadis, um, responsible for our solutions from both a asset capability perspective, but also from technical capability perspective. So I have a, a pretty broad role at the moment. Um, this is a topic really close to my heart. Um, I've been with Arcadis for 13 years, um, and in the last uh, three years, uh, I've had the, the opportunity to, um, to, to work on digital transformation um, and business transformation um, and do some acquisitions of, of acquiring technology based companies, um, which has given me a different perspective. I've been able to step out of the, the big beast that is a, a global consultancy um, and take a look back um, through a different lens. Um, and this is what really started um, my um, campaign i think it feels like in arcadis to to look at our business model and what's happening in our environment both to what the needs of our clients and our customers are um, but also uh, the impact of, of of technology on our business model and, and what's that that's doing to the, the how we deliver and the value that we can deliver um, so um yeah so really really pleased to be here i think um it's also uh, important to say and this is why Emma Jane and I are here uh, talking together that, um, you know, me as a leader and other leaders in an organisation such as Arcadis, and I'm sure you're all uh, in other organisations, um, this is not a, a, something that, that we can transform as, as individual companies, it has to be an industry response, so it's really important to bring the clients and the consultants together to drive change in our environment, and that's what we're, we're embarking upon with this Future of Consultancy work stream. So very, very excited about that. Back to you, Emma Jane. Thank you. Yep, so uh, Sarah and I are gonna walk you through a bit. Um, well, actually, we've split it from a sort of client perspective, which I'm going to try and bring, and then Sarah with her consultancy perspective, um, and then just walk through the practical interventions that we propose to take. Um, check the next slide, please. So let's start with a view from the client. What is it that is changing? Well, we think actually quite a lot, quite a lot is changing. There are a number of factors that are coming together, have come together in recent times that create a want for something different. Um, and I think it's fair to say that society's expectations 
are changing the need for both what we build and how we build it. And when we talk about clients, we're referring to the full spectrum. So this is project owners, it's asset, uh, asset management organisations um, in both the public and private sector, as well as regulated industries. So starting from this, this is not an exhausted list, but it is a, it, it, we've picked some of the more prominent influencing macro factors. So for example, net zero top left. So Extinction Rebellion and the public mood shift that's put sustainability, moved it really from the fringes um, of how we think about our built environment and infrastructure to right at the heart of the DNA of how we function as an industry. When we think about devolution, localised decision making, giving more autonomy locally that connects communities to the providers of infrastructure interventions and the built environment itself, that makes a difference for the types of interventions that then materialise. Data and digital, so innovation and insights and the potential that this whole area offers, um, really highly desired in my experience by clients, but often not very well understood in terms of what's available and what benefits that can bring. When we think about foresighting, clients that have got their finger on the pulse in terms of the future and foresighting methods, around um, population growth, around resilient cities, really are thinking about now what their plans need to be to invest in resilient assets um, and infrastructure networks and systems. When we think about the role of the board and specifically about corporate reputation as a macro factor, there is a, a prominent trend to take news from just one social media platform that influences the way that boards are thinking about their strategies and how these are understood in the market in terms of how that influences corporate reputation. And finally, innovation for competitive advantage in the top right. So whether it's passengers or customers or users, the, the end um, beneficiaries of these assets, the clients want innovations where they're able to deliver excellence um, and they want to engage in conversations about what the, what the spectrum of that is in terms of what it looks like. Um, a note on COVID-19, we actually feel that COVID-19 is, is likely to heighten and accelerate the effects of all of these disruptors in many ways. So there's, there's generally a trend that we see at the moment to um, the social dividends that potentially result from infrastructure investment. And th this, this shift can only serve to heighten these different macro factors that we're talking about. And I know, Sarah, that you and I, have we talked quite a lot about this and we we're talking earlier today about some of the practical changes you've seen in the client questions you get that, that talk to that COVID piece. Yeah, I think the, the, the theme, and I'm sure lots of other people this will hopefully resonate with, but a lot of our global clients in particular are now rethinking um, their, 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 their real estate footprints. You know, there's questioning the way that they work, um, questioning the, the, the impact of, um, of um, the, the, the speed of change to home working will have on them and how they can think differently about, about their working environments, but also the pressures that it's putting on costs of, of organisations. Um, a lot of organisations obviously will have diminishing revenues at this point in time, which means that they'll, they'll have to sort of make some tough decisions. Therefore, any investments that they are making which that some of them still are. I mean, some of some of the global clients, you imagine oil and gas has been has been hit quite quite badly. Um, you know, they're they're still making investments because they have to think about the future as well. But they're 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 now scrutinizing that and, and probably taking a more data-driven approach to those investments than than when they had um, you know a, a significant amount of cash um, to, to deploy into that into their environment. So so yeah, some some real um, uh, acceleration of some conversations, um, maybe the uh, some of the elephants in the room around productivity and efficiency are being brought to the, the fore in boardrooms, I would suggest, um, and, and different questions are being asked in that environment. Great. Um... So I think that so this these are some of our thoughts on the client perspective. I think now if we could check now, can we have the next slide, please? And I think Sarah, you're going to uh, take us through the world for consultants. Yeah, I mean this is I guess just reflecting on the last three years and maybe sharing some of my own insights um, so, um, on 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 what I've found from a, from being in a, in a consultancy environment. I think there is there's definitely been a, a rise of customer centricity, and and what I mean by that is 
uh, I've noticed a shift in, in our business that we, we're not just talking about our clients, but we're talking about our clients' customers and what do our clients need to um, deliver to their customers to ensure that they've got sustainable businesses and they're investing in the right things. Um, and I think that's heightened by social media. It's heightened by um, devolution agendas. As Emma James just talked about, it's also heightened by access to, to, to better data about what consumers want, what customers want, um, what they're doing with their, um, you know, in their lives. That, that, that data is more readily available. So um, businesses can focus more, um, you know, if you're building a, 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 a new stretch of motorway or if you're building a, a, a rail, um, a railway, you know, HS2, you know, you're thinking about passengers, you're thinking about um, the end users more. Uh, and mapping that back in terms of how you deliver value. So that's definitely um, um, a change. Um, I've felt in the last two or three years in particular. I think the biggest change in our environment is Industry 4.0 and the digital transformation agenda. Um, I think we, you know, if we if we look at most of, of the contracts that we have in, in, in UK, particularly with public sector organisations, but arguably also with private sector organisations, it's still very much a, a, a bums on seats model um, in terms of people-based consultancy. Um, and we do have to question both on the client side and the consultancy side, how are we being incentivized to deliver innovation from a technolo technology perspective, where technology allows you to get to outcomes quicker in a different way. Um, but if you're on a time and materials contract, you're not necessarily incentivized to do that and to drive that innovation. And there are some great examples out there where, where clients, uh, the, you know, gain share models where, where, where consultants are incentivized to do that. But it's still not the norm. There's still a, a lot of frameworks or contracts coming out that, that the biggest question is, well, who am I getting and how often am I getting them and how much is that? What's their rate card? And those are still questions that are very prevalent in our environment. But the opportunities are significant. Uh, I think clients are more switched on to um, data driven insights. That's, that's definitely a big topic of conversation. Um, and I also think that, that we were starting to explore ecosystems with, with new companies and startups. And I know particularly in Arcadis, we've, we've, we've got a, a program called Techstars. Um, and that's, that's to allow us to understand um, you know, the startup environment from a technology perspective and how we can work with ecosystem partners to deliver better outcomes for, for clients as well. So I think the digital transformation is still lagging in our environment. We're, we're, we're one of the last, I think, fisheries and agriculture is, um, is below us, but, but, but not, not that far behind us in terms of digital transformation. Um, but that's also exacerbated by the rise in the gig economy as well i think um and emma, emma jane and i were joking about this this earlier you know that we're seeing more and more of our colleagues uh, decide to work um as 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 um as consultants independent consultants um because people want to deliver value in different ways and people want to use their experience and gain experience in different ways and there's definitely a rise of the gig economy and um arguably you know um you know maybe it's a bold statement but consultancies you won't be be big um, people based organizations in 10 years time, maybe there'll be um, crowdsourcing capabilities from the best talent in the world to solve the client problems, maybe that that's where it's heading and there's a few organizations starting to start up, I don't know whether people know about Comatch and those organizations which uh, are advocating almost the trip advisor of consultancy, which is an interesting concept where you know, we all get rated on the value we deliver um, and we're only as good as the last programme or project or consultancy commission that, that, that we delivered. So that's definitely something that's that's starting to, to sort of manifest itself in our environment. Um, and then and then finally, there's definitely some shift in business models. I think um, personally, I think the business model framework provides us with um, a great toolkit um, to explore what's changing in all our businesses and also I use it quite a lot with clients to understand what's changing in their environments to understand what their needs are um, it allows you to explore you know the desirability aspects of, of, of a proposition or a service and how you might deliver that but also how you can deliver value both to your customer but also back into your own organizations as well so for me it's the whole package um, but what it, it, it 
it, it's not is um, a project based tool. Um, so I think there's some watch outs around how we apply business models and, and, and how we use that language. I think I hear quite a lot business models and commercial models interchangeable, um, used interchangeably. Um, and we should be careful about that because the business model is much bigger and the commercial model is, is one element of it. So, um, but we're definitely starting to see new models emerge. I think um, interesting in our environment, I ask um, some of our teams who are working with some really big clients in the UK, you know, then they say, oh, our clients can't buy software as a service propositions or our clients can't buy um, uh, technology-based propositions. I think, you know, that they are buying these things, they're just not buying them from consultants uh, from the world of uh, the engineering space or the design space. So um, we, we need to, and this is what this work is, is, is designed to help us all with, is to help, help open up those conversations and give some confidence to the best way to buy and get the value um, um, to be delivered. Um, so yeah, I think um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, the business model. I'll, I'll hand back to Emma Jane to sort of uh, give another perspective as well. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please, team. So now that we've looked at a little bit about what's changing from the clients and from the consultants' perspective, let's talk a little bit now about why it matters. Um, it matters because it presents a huge opportunity. Um, a huge opportunity for industry to deliver in a smarter, a better way that will be far more productive across the sector. So I think now we've got this burning platform, there exists an impetus and appetite for a new definition of value. We have to remember that there is another webinar on this whole value piece, but that is an absolutely critical jigsaw piece in this, in this whole picture. Um, so that definition of value is going beyond the initial um, this, this sort of crippling effect that we've had for so many decades in construction, the crippling effect of, of looking at value just from an initial capital cost perspective from those economic buyers. Um, so now we have this, um, we could argue before we've had momentum and advocacy from the supply chain and reasons to buy in a smarter way that's not transactional, that's not a hierarchical buying function that looks purely on outputs and restricts the innovation and productivity of the supply chain. Um, but it's, it's never really sort of truly landed or gained traction. And, and if we've had successes, which we have had, they have been by exception. Um, so this now, these, these factors that come together um, are really a burning platform for change. So we have, um, we are presented with an opportunity to have the permission, this is for clients, these economic buyers, to break the mould. Um, there should be less of the barriers that present to arguing the case for doing things in a better way. Um, that's coupled with the space to explore the art of possible. Um, so this, this is really important. I don't think anybody's expected to know all of the answers in the midst of these different factors that have come together and then been heightened by COVID-19. So nobody's got the answers to all this complexity. So there is this space to then collaborate and talk about what those solutions might be between client um, and consultant and the wider delivery partners. Um, and all of that equals the opportunity to prove out, try and test new delivery models and a, a smart way of delivering. Uh, and I think, Sarah, you're going to talk us through um, what some of those might look like from a consultancy perspective. Sure, if you move on to the next slide, please. So, um, I... I, I I sort of we don't, shouldn't underestimate um, some of the complexities around um, why there's a, a, a need to bring about um, change both from a, in a client environment but also in a consultancy environment around um, how clients are, are buying um, from our marketplace but also how we deliver value um, and what the opportunities are. I think going back to my earlier comments about the, the, the changes in our industry and the, the factors that are potentially disrupting us or providing us with opportunities if we want to put a positive um, spin on it, um, is that we've, we've got um, what I would call these multiple epicenters of innovation going on in our business models as traditional consulting organisations and they're happening all the time um, and different people are, are challenged with, with, with dealing with it. Um, but each one requires a different starting point um, and, and I think the, the beauty of, of what I've learned personally um, over the last 
three years in particular, is that um, something as simple as moving um, from a, 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 a service or a, a component of a commission from somebody, a person delivering it to, to uh, it being automated as a service fundamentally disrupts your business model. And I think sometimes we underestimate the change. Uh, it changes the value to the client. It changes uh, the way in which you need to describe how that value is delivered. Um, it changes your cost base. Uh, it changes potentially the way that you might need to get paid. For that. And it also asks you questions around, well, OK, well, if, um, if we're going to move from a, a person doing that job to um, partially automating or using technology to, to do that, that person's job. Um, what, does that, um, what does that do in terms of um, you know, how we organize our teams internally? How do we operationalize that? Um, and are we only gonna do this once or are we gonna do it 20 times? Or are we gonna do it 100 times? So you'd have a different um, sort of response if you're delivering a big iconic project um, such as a, you know, a, a, a cross rail uh, type project. Um, which has lots of unique elements to it um, versus, um, you know, you're delivering a highway scheme and it's the same type of highway scheme across um, lots of different counties in, in the UK. Um, it's a, potentially a highly scalable solution. So that's where the business model um, conversation and those epicenters of innovation become really important to understand what's changing. Um, and just to sort of bring a bit of my insights into the conversation, that we've, we've, we've found that there are often these four um, epicenters in the business model. One is resource driven, often being disrupted by technology, but could, could also be um, disrupted by um, smaller businesses or, or um, micro consultancy being able to deliver the same service for a cheaper, cheaper um, a fee because they don't have the overheads of big organizations, that could also be a, a resource driven innovation. Uh, similarly, I think, um, you know, our industry um, has in part had margin erosion since um, in the last five years, I think um, PwC have, have, have done quite a lot of research into this, but there has been a, a fall in steady fall of margin in, in our environment over the last five years. Um, so we're having to, to think about our cost to serve, and I, I know some big consultancies operate um, global excellence centres and work with um, other partners to deliver solutions, and that would be an example of finance driven uh, innovation where actually you've got to reduce the cost to serve and then you've also got to look at well what does that mean to the customer, what does that mean to the way we deliver and how do we get paid for that, and, and, and uh, again um, it starts to ask questions from a different perspective. I think the customer driven one, I, I'm sure this will resonate with any consultants out there, but hopefully also with any, any clients on the call that um, sometimes, and I, I certainly experienced this more, I think our, our clients are more open to co-creation where um, they're asking for different things. There may be some disruption going on in their own organisation, retail banking is a good example, or um, you know, that they're, they're finding that their world is changing. So what's happening to their business model and, and actually um, do they need different support from, from consultancy um, than maybe they've had in the past? And, and, and that would be an example of customer driven innovation. And then there's also, you know, as consultants, we have a deep heritage around lots of technical areas of expertise. And I think the value that we bring to our marketplace is bringing technical expertise um, to solve some of our clients' um, biggest challenges that they, they can't solve on their own. And, and I think um, there's a lot of examples. I think the you know, particularly UK-based consultancies are great innovators around not waiting for the problem to arise, but getting out into the market and saying, actually, there's a problem coming and we've got a solution for it. And that's an, off, an example of offer-driven innovation. Um, but partly why I wanted to share this and why this matters so much is because um, no matter where you start, um, uh, this in, these kinds of innovations are probably happening quite unconsciously in a lot of organisations and therefore it's very difficult then to have the conversations with the client around what it's doing to value. Um, a really simple example would be taking something from an Excel spreadsheet and putting it into a Power BI dashboard. Um, might be um, a really simple example but um, why would you do that? Um, have you asked your clients if they want that and, and obviously there's an enhanced potential outcome for them in terms of getting access to data quicker um, could be that, that they get more accurate data in a, in a, in a better visualized format but 
you know, they might not be prepared to pay for that change or, um, the, you know, there's all sorts of questions that you then have to go and ask in terms of before you do that to make sure that that's worthwhile for your organisation to do. Uh, my own experience is, that, and, and not just of Arcade, but also friends that I've got in other consultancies, is that we, we often do a lot of that unconsciously, therefore nobody really knows where the value's gone um, and it just automatically changes. Um, um, it becomes the norm very quickly. I think sometimes we, we, we may be in a, in a point where we're eroding value in our own marketplace if we're not careful. So um, there's a balancing act. Um, and then also just to bring some insight, and in, um, I touched on it earlier about um, the difference between the business model and the commercial model. I think when, when Emma Jane and I started talking about this, and I think even Hannah before Christmas, I think both were really surprised that um, I, I, I've present I've developed a framework in Arcadis that at the back of it and it's, it's very much at the back of it because we try and avoid having the conversation first there are 52 different pricing models that we could apply into our marketplace and I think generally um, and I've done the research across our industry we probably use about three or four um, and it, it, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to see the outcomes of this piece of work that we're all working on now as to how we can open up to clients that you know um, once once we as consultancies have, have understood what business models are suitable for us, it enables us to offer a, a, a better selection of pricing options for clients, but we can only do that if clients are ready to, to consume in that way as well. Um, so, so yeah, so I think that, you know, to, to summarize it, we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't underestimate the complexity um, of the changes that are happening across our business and changes will come in different forms. Um, but, but we need to um, also use this to have different conversations with our clients around the appropriate models, commercial models, business models, but um, you know, um, um, ultimately how we deliver that value to the clients and back into our own organisations. And I'll hand back to, to Emma Jane. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Um, so that's right. Lots of complexity, lots of change, and we recognise that all this is not straightforward. Wants some proper sort of attention, and so what are we going to do about it? Uh, we're going to take practical action and we're working closely with the construction innovation hub to grab the opportunity and to drive the change that's needed um, so we've developed a program the future of consultancy commercial models program um, the um, not the non-deliberate acronym i'll leave you to work that out with um, colleagues about how that actually sounds when you say it so the program is all about developing pragmatic tools that enable clients and consultants um, together with their delivery partners to embrace smarter ways of working around infrastructure investments. Um, so we are focused on the uh, on, on three key products. So the first is the client approach framework and risk tool. Um, there is a lot of stuff in that. So it's essentially this is a framework that will help clients to undertake that proper upfront strategic thinking. Um, that we often find is missed or sort of skated over and, and not done in, in enough detail to sufficiently inform um, the delivery model or the contract that then goes out to market. So within the client approach framework and risk tool, um, we will be looking to develop a framework that, for example, really walks a client through thinking about value, um, thinking about what value, the mould mix of that value they want from their investment across the five value capitals is, um, and that helps us to determine priorities and trade-offs. Um, we'll be looking at risk, so a profile of the barriers, constraints, and the potential derailers to realising that value mould mix, uh, mold mix, mold mix that has been expressed in terms of value. We'll be looking at market, so a summary of the market capability and capacity profile that considers the timeline for investment within that context of the broader market factors. We'll be looking at what type of client the particular client wants to be and desires to be over a longer term. Um, so looking at maturity in various capability areas and, and the operating model that goes with that. Um, and then the, and then coupled with that is then the commercial strategy and all the things that sit within that. So for example, the commercial model, the contract payment mechanism, the contract incentive mechanism and the procurement approach. So really it's that sort of end to end from step one, what value are we actually trying to realise to how should we set ourselves up 
to what is the commercial strategy that helps us realize that we will be designing a framework and a risk tool to walk clients through that process. The second pro product then, the business services catalog. Um, sorry, just going back to the previous slide, if we could, thanks Tim. So the business services catalog. So this is, this is all about then from the consultants and the markets uh, suppliers perspective. So essentially this will be a catalog of product line offers that a consultant um, would like to take to market and the accompany, accompanying operating model and commercial offer that sits alongside that. This talks uh, quite a lot to what Sarah was outlining just on the, on the slide before um, and is, is the means to, to, to both helping consultants articulate the full breadth of what they can offer rather than having to start from a default position with a client of people on seats on a, on a time basis. Um, and it's also a, a means to having conversations with clients to sort of share out of possible and, um, and provide that, that catalog approach to, to, to different ways of, of delivering um, our skill set and value. The third area then, and it's in a different colour on purpose, and that'll become evident when we move on to the next slide in a minute. So the third area is, is um, a sort of, it's a looking at case studies and appraising the efficacy of the value in that delivery um, so that we can draw out good practice, so that we can draw out lessons learned and pitfalls to why something's worked or why it's not worked. And having that intel then inform the creation of this product one and product two. Um, so we can move on to the next slide now, please, Chetna. That'd be great. Um, so this slide then sort of sets out the, the product work stream. This is how we're going to set ourselves up as a program. At the top, the, the orange circle with one in it is underpinned then by research. We'll have a research team um, which is underpinned by you, you, academic academics and university research PhD. So we're, we're looking at robust academic research to really underpin the work that we do together with those demonstrators and those case studies. Um, so we're not looking to reinvent the wheel here. This is about drawing on um, our networks and drawing on research and case studies that already exist and exploring what's worked, what's not worked, what is the case for change. Um, and then in an iterative way, working with industry to develop these two core products. Um, I will pause there and hand to Sarah on how you can get involved, which will bring us to a close. Sarah, please. Yeah, if you can just move the slide on, that'd be great. So um, there's a couple of touch points, actually. I think we were keen to um, hear what we would call user stories, the good, the bad and the ugly around where uh, you as clients or consultants have experienced um, uh, uh, great outcomes, actually, as a result of really thinking about the value that needs to be delivered um, and uh, thinking um, beyond the traditional um, approach to, to engaging with consultants to um, that, that, that's really important, but also what's not worked. So we're keen to hear um, what's, what's not worked as well, um, or has there been any real um, challenges and, and, and what's been learned from that. So that, that, that's really important to us. And then um, as we go through the process of evolving the products and developing the products, um, we'll also be looking for, for, for people to, to validate some of our assumptions and potentially test uh, some of the, 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 the elements of the products, the features and the functionality of the products that we're developing. Uh, so we're, we're very, very keen to, to sort of engage with, um, with people on those, those two points. Um, yeah, that, that's it, Jane. I think so. Um, we, we haven't got there yet, but the intention for our programme is to pull together um, a stakeholder engagement plan. Um, we want to be able to, as Sarah's just outlined, be able to work with um, our partners work with industry to test the evolution of this product development and to get those insights. So, so more on that, we don't have it yet, but more on that to come. And if we move on to the final slides, I think we're through to Q&A with um, Hannah. Thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. My goodness, that was an awful lot of content there. I should imagine there'll be a few people watching that back. I certainly know I feel like I need to watch it back to get my head around. Um, you know, just uh, some of the detail covered an awful lot of ground. So thank you both very much. Um, really, yeah, really, really valuable stuff. So we've got quite a few questions coming through. So I'm going to, to move on to those. So we get, um, again, back into the detail while we've got you both. So 
Um, the first question, um, Emma Jane, is around the um, the framework and the, um, the the commercial models work that we're doing. Um, could you just explain how this would be um, scaled to make it uh, applicable for regional um, delivery and SME firms as well? Is this this isn't just going to be something that is useful for for you know big big firms doing major projects? Could you just um, explain a bit more about about how you're going to tailor it for that? Uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent question. Something which we've grappled with um, at length in this early design phase. Um, I don't, I'll be really honest, I don't know exactly how we're going to do that yet. The ambition is that it will be applicable to all sizes of clients. So I would imagine that we will sort of have an approach of a, of a level zero, level one, level two, um, and we will carry through the principles that are relevant to any size, type, nature of client, and then we will build in more of the detail where it's relevant to a sort of a larger infrastructure program. Um, but that is absolutely on our radar. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd be keen in our consultation piece. I'd be keen for the sort of user experience on on similar models of how that's worked, how that's not worked. I, I it would be it would be helpful to sort of hear some of those experiences. Mm -hmm. And as you say, we've got that sort of it's not finished yet. So, you know, the more um, the more we can make sure during that period that we can bring in a balanced you know, perspective of different clients with different drivers, as you say, that's really going to help us make sure that it's, you know, it's, it's fit for purpose and is applicable, albeit with, a, you know, tailoring it for different clients with different needs, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Brilliant. OK. Um, right. So a question for you, Sarah. Um, in your presentation, you talked about consultants um, needing to understand more about the outcomes that their clients uh, are seeking. What do you think that do you think that throws up some challenges in terms of the skills and all the traditional skills and behaviours of consultants? Yeah, I think it is um, throwing up quite a lot of challenges because I think um, for a long time, a lot of what we've delivered has been that technical excellence and I think that's that's not going away anytime soon but I think customers are now um our clients are asking for more I and certainly feel it in, in in my experience and also I think the the competitive nature of our environment means we're all trying to be better than each other um, and that creates um different conversations with the clients which means that we raise their expectations whether that's inadvertently or um or otherwise so I, I do think um, it requires different skills. I think one of the things that I've, I've learned um, as, as well is that um, it, it's linked a little bit to the last question is that um, often we sell to organisations and I think more and more, and this is goes back to my point around customer centricity, um, we need to understand the person that we're selling to and what their pressures are. So for example, something that Emma Jane and the team and I have talked about is in the in the toolkit we should think about um the role of the person that's, that's buying the solution and um how many other people have got the same problem and therefore that gives you the answer to how you scale something or whether it's just a one-off um and, and, and really understanding the people behind the problem statements uh, is going to be more and more important going forward um there's a lot of linkage between the, the concepts of design thinking and the commerciality and operationalizing um, of that through using the business model frameworks um and i think that's um part of, of of the ask of our clients now is that they they are wanting people that can help them through change as well i i, I think i think change management is becoming a um the blend between strategic consultancy and technical consultancy um we're definitely seeing that converge um and clients wanting and um, wanting more of a blended skill set mm -hmm. uh, can i add something to that on. Yeah, to that question. I think the cultural piece here is really interesting at the moment as well, because coming from a legacy of um, sometimes there being a bit of a, a sort of closed shop, a closed door when we want to talk about delivering in a different way. I, it's back to that slide we talked about earlier. I feel that for quite strongly that there's now this sort of permission to break the mould on on the, the um, established ways of, of culturally how we've done business before. And people are up for a conversation on on what the response um, could be because we are in this uncharted territory. So I think culturally that's, um, somebody asked about behaviours in the question and I think culturally that's that's going to be a really significant part of this. 
Yeah, I think, you know, I absolutely agree. And it sort of leads on to a kind of follow-up question and maybe we'll just discuss because it does link to that is the, you know, this, this shift against area in your part of the presentation, you talked about, you know, the offer driven um, mentality and the fact that actually, rather than being reactive to a client coming to market with an RFP, it's, you know, almost how do you think independently about creating your offer and then sell that to um, to clients and and you know perhaps that is culturally is is a challenge maybe some of the larger consultants it feels more comfortable to them because of the types of you know markets that you're already operating but I don't know again just be interested in your thoughts on on how uncomfortable or comfortable you might find that from different business perspectives um, particularly maybe thinking about the SMEs who've been in a very yeah. stable I think, yeah, in a way, smaller businesses are better at it than as bigger businesses, because I think they can be more agile in, and responsive to um, uh, seeing a gap in the market. Um, so I think there's there's definitely um, an, an advantage to, to, to um, the pace at which you can respond. I guess where I see it at the moment is um, it's, a lot of it's research driven. So um, for my own organisation, we've got, um, you have to apologise, but my dogs are going mental in the background for some reason. So. <laughs> Hear that too much. Uh, uh, the joy of COVID and working at home. Um, but I, I see our environment business, um, and I'm sure anybody that's got an environmental component um, to their business, um, but, but a lot of it's research based, it's about contaminants, and they're at the forefront of their industries. Uh, and that's what I would class as offer driven. They don't wait for a client to come to them and say, I've got a problem with this contaminant, that they're out there telling people that there's this problem emerging and we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. No, it's really interesting to see, yeah, to see that actually maybe it's not, not foreign for the whole sector, but we need to maybe bring more of that in. I think it's sort of like, yeah, certainly our traditional kind of structural engineering, that sort of thing. It's just not, you know, it's not, not something that you see very often there, is it? But again, they've got the same technical capability. So, we, you know, in theory, there's, there's nothing to, you know, to, to stop us from, from moving that. It's just a behavior. Yeah. I also think the tech, the, the, there's a steer. I mean, obviously, with the disruption going on from a digital perspective, we, we can also take our steer from the productization environment that digital um, operates in. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll all know um, good, bad or indifferent around the likes of Oracle and IBM Maximos and those kind of things where they've productized something, they put those products out. Um, and that's that's offer driven as well. Um, that's often based on them seeing, again, gaps in need. Um, but productizing it and then products either crash or, uh, crash or, or you know, they're, they're either successful or they're not, basically. Um, and there's a little bit of that mindset, I think, that's starting to come into the world of consultancy, um, where, you know, you, you might test things. They might not be 100 percent, you know, the perfect answer, but, but it, it might be serving a need in the marketplace. But you only do that by putting your product out there. And I'm starting to see that happening more and more in our environment as well. Mm -hmm. No, that's really interesting. And I think, like you say, it's you know, a huge opportunity there for firms of all sizes um, because you can you know, pivot if you're a small firm, you know, and there's different advantages. If you're a large firm, perhaps you've got more breadth of client interaction to be able to identify those needs. So I think, yeah, there's something for everybody, I'd hope, in this. Um, OK, so last couple of questions um, now. So there's, well, there's one I'm going to answer myself. Um, someone has asked, how widely would you cast the net in defining value? particularly in terms of sustainability outcomes, so things like decarbonisation, natural capital, uh, improved climate resilience. So I will um, shameless plug for some work that we've already done in response to this. So actually just yesterday we launched our five capitals report, um, which focused on the sort of, if you like, the precursor to this commercial discussion that we're having today, which is the upstream framework around almost guiding clients through those decisions, through that, um, understanding of what they really value um, and actually what what we published yesterday was a framework which set out five capitals which did cover natural capital um, alongside some of the more traditional things like financial capital um, and, and manufactured capital to to give a framework for the clients to be able to to almost determine what value looks like through their lens in a structured way um, and it kind of gave them the if you like the options list of everything they could consider and then encourage them to, to prioritise that before coming to market so that when they came to market, you had that really clear steer on actually this project is all about decarbonisation or, you know, decarbonisation is important, but actually what they want is something which is, you know, operationally through its whole life requires very little doing to it. 
Um, so you have the kind of relative importance of the different values, but it was very, very wide ranging in terms of the, the scope of, of value. Um, so I will um, I'll make sure that when we get the, this webinar circulated, we circulate the details of that because it is a kind of an enabler, a precursor to the conversation we've been having today at the same time. Um, so I think maybe last two questions, or one each for you before we, uh, before we close. So uh, firstly, um, Sarah, a question for you around something you mentioned about learning from other sectors. So you said there's lots of different buying and pricing models that you've seen, 52, I think you said, in other sectors. What's, um, what are your thoughts around that and around, you know, which are the most relevant? So maybe a couple of just tidbits of, oh, actually, that would be really relevant from another sector that you've spotted that we th you think we should be doing more of. Yeah, it's a really interesting one. This is one that really fascinates me as well, because um, despite the 52 that I packaged up for, for, for sort of opening the dialogue up in my own organisation, um, there's actually thousands. I mean, it, it's mind boggling, actually, what's what's out there and the different ways you can uh, you can price things. Um, I think uh, that the, the, the ones that are, are, are really relevant are the data driven ones. So anything that uh, where clients can access data. I mean, you can imagine the wealth of information that, that us as consultancies have in terms of benchmark data and um, insights. And, you know, how do we make that more readily available? Um, you know, do we do it in isolation or do we do it as a collective would be an interesting one. And then that might take you down a subscription rate i think um, where people get regular information often um it's not not necessarily saying that people are prepared to pay for that either so how do you know what's valuable from a, um, an insight perspective in terms of well i can go and get that myself versus um the exclusive nature of, of data and insights um, that are generated through the work that we, we deliver um, so that's a really interesting one i think um at tiered pricing um, is an interesting one as well. You know, there are different pressures in different environments in our world um, where you may offer um, a range of, of, of prices depending on um, the nature of the client. So, you know, that's based on, you know, would you offer the, a, a public sector organisation the, the same price as a, a, a private sector organisation? Um, and, and, and how can you, you innovate and, and, and develop solutions that um, give you greater insights from the private sector into the public sector and that becomes a, a, um, a, a valuable model um, but you don't necessarily, there's different price points in those markets so you might have more of a, a tiered pricing structure uh, and, and limiting scope as well around that as well. Um, I think there are um, more and more technology based um, pricing models that are coming into our world um, and you know if you think about big programs using um, proprietary software a lot of clients are now asking for the control tower type activity that sits on top of that which is not easy to, to find nor is easy to configure so I think more and more um, there may be um, software based um, models um, that clients buy and, and they buy services alongside those so there could be a configuration of different pricing models and it'll be interesting to see the outcome of this work to see um, you know how um, how the conversation goes with clients around really breaking scopes down into different packages that, that ultimately build up to delivering the value and the outcome um, so yeah I, I think we're also exploring that through this work as well so um, what what I've done for our pay this might not necessarily be um, be also valuable for but might not be the same outcome for the piece of work that we do more broadly for the industry as well so um, yeah there's, there's also quite a lot of interesting ones that are quite tactical uh, I always like the decoy pricing one which I'm not quite sure is appropriate for our industry but it's always good to share about never buy the cheap the second cheapest bottle of wine on the on the wine list because it is the cheapest <laughs> And that's where they make the most value so there's a little bit of psychology of pricing in that as well which i find quite fascinating mm, definitely and there's a, there's a lot sort of watch this space isn't there i think because obviously this is this is a, you know the start of the research we've definitely not concluded yet okay. yeah to my, point, to my point earlier it, unless clients are prepared to consume in that way then some of them will, will automatically not be appropriate not relevant so that's the testing that we need to do that's that's, that's the valuable part of this piece of work in, 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 in certainly one of the aspects of it is understanding the typologies of organizations what they can and can't consume because they will have constraints you know public procurement and other other constraints financial constraints will, will limit um, some of these things 
Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, as you say, like collective, you know, collective engagement with the clients is going to be really valuable to almost create that market for the businesses then, um, which is how I see this evolving going forward. Right, final question to you, Emma Jane. Um, mm-hmm. We've got somebody who wants to draw on your experience from working client side. So what advice would you give if you're you know, sitting as a client? What advice would you give to consultants on what you'd like to see them doing differently in relation to their business models? Um, I think, okay, I'll, I'll say three things. So one, one would be don't go to a client. I think, sorry, you might have already made this point. Don't go to a client without really understanding where they're coming from, their environment and how it would be helpful for them to buy. So tailor it to the environment. And if you can, if you know the economic buyer, tailor it to the person. That's where I would I would start. Um, my second would be um, understand the person, the client and their particular political environment that they sit in. And if they need support to lobby or to affect change, then work with them in whatever way you can to do that, perhaps drawing back from your um, own organ- organisation or relationships that you might have. Um, and third, I would say um, don't be afraid to bring the really innovative solutions. Um, I often find I, had to, as, a, as a client, I was often in a position where I was trying to sort of ask consultants to be more ambitious and bring more radical solutions to the table, whereas I would have um, I would have really welcomed a conversation that that gave me total art of possible and, and, and worked with me to um, to present how that would benefit the, the programme and the business. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. OK, no, that's um, thank you. Fantastic advice. There. What, a, what a high point to end on. Right. Um, so I think that's that's it for today's webinar. But thank you ever so much, both of you, for your time. Um, I think it's going to be a really exciting project going forward. And I think it's a really good opportunity to come and start talking about it because we don't have all the answers yet. But as you say, it's, it's sort of flying the flag forward, doing this piece of work. You know, we've got some, some great stuff to, to get us started. Come and get involved. Um, so thank you both for taking the time on that. Um, You're just to close out now, um, we've obviously got a few of these coming up. Um, we've got something um, next week around defining value for government procurements. So this is looking at maybe a sort of a subset client side discussion on that. Um, we've got some things looking at work, the future of the workplace and the skills profile and the attitudes of the emerging professionals. Um, and then a little bit later on in June, we've got something around technology. Um, and we've got a provocative title, seen through the hype, but it's really about trying to, to unpick that sort of um, technology uh, pillar, if you like, for the future consultancy offer. I mean, what are the things that are really going to, to make a difference and, and what might you, you know, back to our business models, be being sold by the technology providers that is, is less helpful or offers less value to your clients. So we're trying to unpick some of that. So hopefully as a series, um, we'll help you with this sort of planning and thinking for your business and their, your future um, going forward, which I'm sure is front of mind to a great many of you at the moment. So thank you all very much for joining us. Thanks again to my um, speakers. Fantastic um, content, an awful lot there to, to get through. And as I said, this will be available um, online. We will circulate the link to you. So please do watch again um, and circulate uh, to your colleagues as well, because there's so much in there that was really valuable. So thank you both for joining me and thank you very much to everybody who listened online. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.